Good evening, everybody. How are you all today? Good. Did you do your homework yesterday? You did. No wonder you are full of smiles. As we are standing, let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this evening. Thank you, Holy Father, for being with your dear children this morning. Thank you for speaking through your servant, Pastor White, this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for enabling us to offer unto you this wonderful sacrifice of praise and worship. Thank you, Father. You are a good God. Your grace and mercy endures forever and ever, Lord. Now we come before your holy presence. One more time on the second day of this meeting, Lord. We humble our hearts before your holy presence. And we ask you to speak to us. Who are we, Lord, that you should choose to come and abide in us? Who are we, Lord, that you should choose to come and speak to us? All for your great grace. It's because of your great grace and because of your compassions that we are not consumed. Thank you, Father. Thank you. One more time. We humbly look up to you. And we pray that you will now speak to us, Lord. Make your ways known to us. Teach us your ways. And make us to know your ways. That we may learn how we can prepare ourselves to meet with you, Lord. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you, Spirit of the living God, open our hearts, open our ears, give us an understanding heart and a listening ear right now. And give us an obedient heart. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Spirit of the living God. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I see on the pulpit here, some of my books are kept. So by this sign, I gather that I'm supposed to introduce them to you. And that's why they have kept it here. If not, they wouldn't have kept it here, you know. So, I don't want to take too much of my time by always introducing them. It was much easier to introduce them when I had only one book. <laughs> now when there were too many, Anyway, this book is called The Goodness of God. This is based on how good our God is. You know, many times we hear some good, solid teaching that edifies us, that helps us to go up to the next level. But you know, once in a while when we are so broken, and we are sitting down and just crying and weeping and hoping that someone will speak to us a word of edification, a word of comfort and a word of exhortation. This book is something like that. A, a book, a message about the goodness of God, how he cares for us, how he takes care of us in different ways. His great goodness. So this will just bless your heart to know how good God is. 
This book, The Spirit Controlled Life, is one of the first messages that I ever received when I came to the US in 1991, the first time. The original title of this book was Walking in the Spirit. That was the original title. And this was um, the second book that I ever wrote 24 years ago. And over the years, I got more understanding, more light. So I changed the title to make it more apt. So it, it's now called The Spirit Controlled Life. And the theme of this book is it is absolutely possible to live a life without sinning. It is absolutely possible. Because the Bible says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not sin. So the question is, how to walk in the Spirit? In all my quests, in my walk with God, whenever I read these scriptures, I always pose this question before the Lord. But how to do it? You said, walk in the Spirit. How to walk in the Spirit? So that's my quest all the time. And the Lord is always very gracious to come and answer that question. How we can walk in the Spirit? In simple ways. Not very complicated. So, you want to learn how to walk a life without sinning. Once you learn how to walk without sinning, then there is therefore no more condemnation. Amen? Now, this book is a companion to this book. Because this answers the other question that is found in Matthew chapter 5 verse 48. It says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, I asked the Lord this a question. How can we be perfect like you? You are perfect because you are God. But how can we be perfect? But then, for the Lord Jesus to tell us be perfect that itself tells us that it is not impossible it is possible the question is how to be perfect right that's the question how to be perfect and so I fasted and prayed for three days and on the third day the Lord Jesus came and he answered this question and he said the answer to your question is found in one scripture and in that one scripture, there are three steps. How any believer, whether they are young believer or old believer, they can be perfect like the Father in heaven. And this other book is a, is a good subject that we all must know and practice. This is on fasting and prayer. So that's why I call it aptly, exercise towards godliness. Fasting is like an exercise, you know. So, you know, many times when we fast and we pray, we use one simple method for all kinds of situations. And you'll find many times that your fasting becomes futile. It's not producing the fruit that is intended or the result that is intended and the reason is because one size does not fit all some are big some are small like me some are very big you know even clothes comes in different sizes right now they have tight fitting <laughs> and they have slim fit and then uh, they have uh, free size any size can get into a free size. From the biggest size to the smaller size. That's what free size means, right? Am I right, everybody? No. Oh, I'm wrong. Huh? Anyway. In the same manner, one kind of fasting does not apply to all kinds of situations. So in this book, I explore the different situations in our life that requires different kinds of fastings. Fasting basically means put away food. But 
most of us, in fact, 99.9% of Christians make one common mistake. The common mistake is we avoid the food, then we go about our mundane duties, and we don't pray. Fasting without prayer is called dieting. <laughs> By that concept, almost all Americans are fasting, you know, because they are crazy about dieting, right? It's a billion dollar industry in the US, or maybe trillion dollar. And the Easterners are catching up with you. They are also getting into this craze of dieting, although they are small. You know, once I had a staff. She's a very lean girl. And uh, one day, she wasn't taking her lunch. So I asked her, my dear daughter, why are you not eating lunch? She said, you know, my friends tell me that I'm very fat. And she's a small girl. So who told you you are fat? You're not fat, you're just normal. And she went on a big diet. So you want to learn how to fast in the right way. When we fast, it is vitally important to spend quality time in prayer. Then the, your fasting will produce fruit. If not, it is waste. It's just dieting. So you don't want to do that, do you? So you want to learn these various uh, principles of dieting? I mean, sorry. <laughs> oh my. Seems like I'm becoming very American, you know. <laughs> Not dieting. Princ principles of fasting. Oh my, I should not stay much longer in the U.S., no? <laughs> All right, are you ready? Yes. We are going to continue from last night. Last night I shared with you about how we can prepare for a visitation of God. And when the Lord gave me this message... He's, he said something, he prefaced it by saying, tell the people, I'm going to come to visit them. Before the Lord Jesus Christ comes visibly for all the world to see him. Now when he comes at that time, the Bible tells us very clearly in Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 16, during that time of his visitation, he's coming for two purposes. To judge and to make war. That is for the whole world. That's his purpose. To judge and to make war. Now we don't come under that category. Do you? No. So that is for the whole world. But before he comes for the whole world, he wants to come and meet you. He wants to come and meet you because the bride should get ready to meet her bridegroom. I'm sure you all are ardently looking forward for the rapture, don't you? But you know, not all Christians are going to be caught up in the rapture. Not all. The bride of Christ is part of the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is not the bride of Christ. They are two different. Often at times we have thought they are one and the same. They are not one and the same. It's the bride who will be caught up to meet the bridegroom in the air. Not the body of Christ. I'm sorry to shock you. But that is... The basic naked truth, bare, bare truth, not all who calls Lord, Lord, will have the doors open to them. No. 
only they who have made themselves ready to meet the bridegroom only they will be caught up you know i think it was in the year 1985 i was visiting the nation of singapore for meetings so i landed at the airport and took a cab to go to the pastor's house where i was going to stay and at the time of my arrival it was about 8ish or 9ish you know and the airport is not in the city it is on a reclaimed land by the sea coast on the eastern part of the country so all along from the airport in, when you drive along the highway to go to the city it's you are driving all along on a reclaimed land where there's nothing except the airport and the beach that's all and you got the sea so i sat in this taxi and i just closed my eyes and i was praying and after a little while i heard very clearly a distinct sound of the blowing of a trumpet so i turn around to see where this sound of trumpet was coming from probably i thought maybe some there were some school kids who are involved in dr- playing uh, in their school band so they were blowing so i looked around in all direction and i couldn't find anyone playing you know you know any any band so i asked this taxi driver i said excuse me sir where is this sound of trumpet coming from he looked around <laughs> say what sound i said that sound trumpet so he what sound I said, you know, pom 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 pom. <laughs> I tried to imitate it. So he thought, ah, and he grumbled something in that Chinese language, you know. And then he continued driving. So I felt a little embarrassed. Uh, maybe I thought, you know, I didn't make that. I didn't imitate the pom 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 sound in the right manner for him to understand. So a little while later, again. i heard the sound this is a very clear distinct audible sound the blowing of a trumpet so again i asked this man sir where is this sound of trumpet coming from so he turned and looked at me say where are you coming from say from india say no wonder you are hearing weird sounds <laughs> so i felt very very embarrassed you know so i thought how can this man not hear the sound so i just kept quiet and a few minutes later for the third time i heard the sound of the trumpet very distinct very clear very audibly and as i was about to ask this man sir the sound of trumpet is really sounding i was cautioned by the holy spirit saying be still and hear clearly this sound so i quieted myself and i paid attention to the sound of the trumpet and i realized it was coming far away from the heavens you know in the spirit you can gauge where it is coming from so i discerned it was coming far away from heaven and then the holy spirit told me this there are two of you in this taxi but only you could hear he could not hear this is what the lord jesus said there will be two person in the field one will be taken one will be left behind two person will be grinding the millstone one will be taken one will be left behind two will be lying on the bed one will be taken one will be left behind only they who have made themselves ready will hear the sound of the trumpet that will be blown on that day not everybody will hear the sound even among the christians not everybody will hear only they who have made themselves ready this is the scary part you know because only they who have made themselves ready if you don't want to get ready you will not hear the sound of the trumpet 
You know, I'm sure you all have attended weddings in your life. And on the wedding day, the bridegroom, he waits for the bride to come. And the bride takes her own sweet time. <laughs> Don't they? They do, right? The poor bridegroom ends up waiting for her. Poor guy, you know. Only once in my life so far, I have been at a wedding where the bride was waiting for the bridegroom. <laughs> Only once. And the bridegroom delayed coming to the wedding for more than an hour. And the poor bride was just standing there on the aisle and she was waiting and waiting and waiting. And I thought to myself, because I was preaching at the wedding, you know. So everybody was getting tired of waiting for the bridegroom. Me too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, when uh, after, uh, after the bridegroom came and the wedding started rolling, and that when the time came for me to preach, I got up and I told them, this is the most prophetic wedding that I've ever attended in my entire life. Everybody thought I was making, either I was reprimanding them or reprimanding the bridegroom for coming late. I told them, no, I'm not reprimanding you. I said, it's very prophetic because just as the bride is waiting for the bridegroom to come, likewise we all are waiting for the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, to come. So this is the most prophetic wedding. So next time you have a wedding, remember this, the bridegroom should not come first. He should come later. Anyway, now, come back to the story of the, the wedding. In the wedding, all women are women, and the bride is also a woman. But on the wedding day, only the woman who had made herself ready will walk down the aisle. Not all women will walk down the aisle, right? If all women walk down the aisle, the poor bridegroom will have a terrible time trying to choose who he wants to marry. Only the bride. That's number one. Number two, have you ever been to any wedding and you saw this bride walking down the aisle in her nightgown? Oh, right? Or her hair disheveled, uncombed, and we, she had no makeup. She just got up from her bed and came rushing to the wedding. Have you ever seen any bride like that? No, right? Even days before the wedding, they, uh, they put on all the makeup. Even on that day, they make up themselves so much so, you can hardly recognize the woman. <laughs> It's true, you know. I once attended a wedding and I told the pastor, they have changed the bride. <laughs> this is not the girl that I know. <laughs> and that girl was my own staff, you know. I could, I could not even recognize my own staff. She was like Saul, become another. So you go through all this hair do, makeup and everything over a long period of time. And then you spend your time and your money. You don't want to rent a gown, you want to buy a gown. Though you're just going to use it once in your lifetime. So you go through all the preparation in the physical, in the same manner you must do in the spiritual. If you, if only she who have made themselves ready will meet the bridegroom. Not everybody. So that is why it is vitally important that we learn how to prepare ourselves to meet the bridegroom. He is coming soon. First to catch away his bride. So that is what we are studying now. So that's the message the Lord gave me. Prepare. But even before that, He's now going to come and visit the church. 
by pouring the powers of the age to come into the church. Because before, I'm sure you all are very well versed with Bible prophecies or the end time theology, that there will be a great harvest that will come in before the coming of the Lord. You believe that? Now for that harvest, God is going to pour the powers of the age to come. And this is something that has never been released in the world yet. So you are going to be the first recipient of these powers of the age to come. How blessed people you people are. Amen. How blessed you are. How gloriously blessed. You know, in the year 2008, I was invited to speak at a conference in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So the afternoon of the first day, I was praying and waiting on God, what he would have me share at that conference. And I was visited by four angels. And the chief among them spoke to me, saying that he identified that he was the chief prince angel over the state of Louisiana. And then he explained to me what had been happening in the state and why the Hurricane Katrina came and devastated Louisiana. He gave me an explanation from a spiritual perspective why the state was judged. Anyway, after that, he said, the God the Father wants you to speak on the powers of the age to come in this conference. I have heard of the phrase powers of the age to come. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4. That's just one phrase, powers of the age to come. It's not even a sentence. It's part of a, a group of scriptures. Other than that, you'll never find it mentioned anywhere else in the entire Bible. No further explanation is given by the Apostle Paul who first wrote it. So I looked at the angel and I said, you know, I've never ever heard anyone ever teach on the powers of the age to come. Neither I myself know anything about this subject. How can I go and preach when I myself don't know? So he just smiled at me and he said, all right, we will now teach you. So they explained to me, what is the powers of the age to come? Now, the most startling statement this angel made that has, has never got out of me over the last 10 years was this. He said, even we, angels who are in heaven, have never seen such a move of God called the powers of the age to come. You know, when he said that, I was really taken aback by that statement. Because angels, you know, they, are, they have been living for eons of time. Even before the creation of the world. They all have been there. So when they have all seen the great moves of God and how God spoke the worlds into existence. And for this angel to say, we have never seen such a move of God that has been reserved till now. Which means, the greatest demonstration of the power of God that this world has never seen from the time of creation is going to be released in these last days. And the best part of the story is, you are going to be the participators in this outpouring. God is going to pour that anointing upon you. But, you need one qualification. That is a qualification. And the qualification is, you must be a nobody. You have that? You must be a nobody. You must be nameless, faceless, reputationless, Peopleless, wireless. (laughs) 
if you have this qualification, then God will pour into you that glory. Because the next move of God, the final move of God, it will come upon the nobodies. It will come upon the little children. It will come upon the youths. It will come upon the old men and the old women. It will come upon chiefly upon the women. You know, God has reserved a special anointing for women. Very special. So all women here, you are overly blessed. Overly blessed. You know, never, never, never has a special group has been kept reserved by God for such a time as this in these last days. There is a prophecy about women in the book of Psalms in 68 verse 11. Great is the company of women. Actually, in the original Hebrew it says, the warrior brides. That's what it said, warrior bride. Great is the company of the warrior bride that will go forth and publish the good news. That's, that's what it calls the woman. You know, and she has been kept in reserved for such a time as this. And God is going to pour a new anointing, a triple fold anointing upon you. The anointing of Miriam, the anointing of Deborah, and the anointing of Anna. You'll pour that triple fold anointing upon you, and you will rise up. And do great extraordinary works like never before. Like no man has ever done before. See what a blessed privilege to be living in these last days. See. Oh. <clears throat> now that does not mean the men will not be used. Don't worry, you are included in the scriptures. If you are a youth, you are part of it. If you are an old man, you are part of it. If you are in between, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so God wants to visit his people. Now like I said yesterday, last night, this visitation will be in threefold. One, a personal Secondly, as a family. Thirdly, a corporate church ministry. So God is going to visit you. And visit is going to be like a revival. A revival that will break out. When God visits his people, awesome signs, wonders and miracles will take place. Now for the Lord to come and visit his people... We have seen in the scriptures, or we can see in the scriptures, several patterns. And that's what we are going to study during this conference. The several patterns. So the first pattern is found in Exodus chapter 19. So the Lord God told the prophet Moses, I am going to come to visit the people. Before I come, you must make the people ready. So, let's continue. And God gave the prophet Moses instructions how to prepare the people for a visitation. Exodus chapter 19 and the verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Verse 10 continues on verse 15. In verse 15, God adds saying, Consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and be ready on the third day. So the first three days, you prepare yourselves and then you come and present yourselves before God on the third day because on the third day, he is going to come to visit you. 
Now look at this um, number three. Three days preparation. What does those three days of preparation signify? They signify death, burial and resurrection. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. The Lord Jesus himself said, I will die, I will be buried, and then I will rise up again on the third day for three days. So it signifies a death, a burial, and you will rise up on the third day. So you must die. If you don't die, you cannot live. Remember what I told you about that uh, grave sucking? Now, you, you, you don't want to go to that extreme. But remember, the dead man who fell on the bones of Elisha. Before the dead man can be resurrected, first, a man has to die. Right? A death must take place in order for a resurrection to be birthed. So the three days signifies death, burial, resurrection. And if you read Esther chapter 4 verse 16, it says that Esther fasted for three days and three nights before she came and stood before the king. She had an audience with the king. She, was, she came and stood before the king to see the face of the king. But before she did that, she prepared herself by fasting for three days and three nights. Secondly, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. We read in the Bible that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. He had no choice. He was forced to fast. Forced to fast. Why forced to fast? Because of stubbornness. Right? Because he was stubborn. When God called him to fast, he didn't want to fast. So now he was forced to fast. See, when you have nowhere else to go, when all other avenues and resources are all cut, and you are emptied of everything, what else can you do? Force fast. So the prophet dead, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. He was forced to fast and he cried to God for three days and three nights. As a result of that, he came out and he preached one sentence message. Not like me preaching for two hours, you know. Just one sentence. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That was just the only message he preached from one end of Nineveh to another end of Nineveh, which is a three days of walking journey. So he repeated himself for three days for the whole of Nineveh to hear. As a result of that, a great revival broke out in Nineveh. So before the revival came, he, was, he fasted for three days and three nights. Thirdly, in Acts chapter 9, verses 9 to 18, you'll read about the apostle Paul. Before he became Paul, he was Saul. And after his encounter with the light of God, he fasted for three days. Again, false fast. He didn't choose it. It was false fast. As a result of the fasting, on the third day, Ananias came to visit him and Paul was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He received an outpouring of a Pentecost experience. Because he missed the Pentecost experience. Because on the day of Pentecost, he was not there. But he had his personal Pentecost. And he prepared himself fasting for three days and three nights. Now, if you read Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 to 2, 
The scripture says, God will bruise us, God will wound us, but on the third day, He will revive us. So revival comes on the third day. So three days of preparation. Now, let's look at the three methods that God himself told the children of Israel how they should prepare themselves to meet with God. And these three ways are the basic standard principles that we should follow all our lives to have an encounter with God, to have our personal revival. You cannot do without these principles. Principle number one, God told the prophet Moses, consecrate and sanctify the people. Ex Exodus chapter 19 verses 10 and 14. He said, consecrate the people, sanctify them, set them apart. The word sanctify in the Hebrew is Kodesh, Q-A-D-E-S-H. And the word Kadesh means to sanctify, to be holy, to make clean, or to also be set apart. Set apart to be kept only for God. People or things are set aside solely for God in worship of Him. So when you consecrate yourselves, this is in line with what I told you earlier, that when you fast, you must pray. See, when you set aside time to fast, that means you are consecrating yourself to set aside a day, set aside a time to seek the face of God. When you set aside, let's say, you know, sometimes people fast for a day or three days or seven days or 40 days, when you consecrate yourself for such a fast, it means you are setting aside yourself, the time, as a time of seeking God and for worship of God. If you set aside yourself and you set aside that time, then it is sanctified. So if you set aside something, a time, then you should not be doing anything else during that time. You cannot mix. You know, I'm sure you have heard this being said. Um, we can walk and pray. You can vacuum your house and pray in tongues at the same time. Have you heard this being said? You can cut, cut the vegetables and pray at the same time. You can take your shower and pray at the same time. Have you done that? Okay. Now, nothing wrong with all that. But recently, a month ago, the Lord had taught me about the order of Melchizedek. And while he was teaching me about the order of the Melchizedek and how the priesthood that God has specially ordained for the last days, how the Melchizedek priesthood, they should ordain themselves. The one thing the Lord told me that day that totally even made me repent because I, like many of you, have done that during when I'm praying in tongues because, you know, your mind is inactive when you're praying in tongues, right? So, when your mind is inactive, it will do the one thing that it knows best what to do. And that thing is, do anything. <laughs> do anything and everything. <laughs> Am I right, Pastor Greg? Anything and everything. So while your mouth is speaking in tongues, your hand and your mind is doing something else. But that day, the Lord told me, that is very wrong. Because... The scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all that is within you. And 
worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all that is within you. So when you are praying unto God in the spirit, but if your mind and your body is doing something else, then you are not worshipping God and loving God with your mind. And because your mind is doing something else. This, the Lord told me, is offering strange fire to God. You are mixing the flesh with the spirit. And when you mix the flesh with the spirit, your sacrifice is rejected. Because it's filthy. So when you set aside time to fast, that's why the word that is used in the scripture is sanctify. Means consecrate yourself. When you consecrate, you don't want to do anything else. Just that. That one time, the one hour or half an hour that you're going to spend time in prayer, you don't want to do anything else. That hour belongs to God. So your entire mind, your heart, all that is within you, thinks about nothing else except focus on God. So that's what you want to be careful of when you sanctify. During the period of consecration, you don't want to do anything that is normal. Because... During that period of sanctification, you do not belong to yourselves. You are a possession of God. When you are a possession of God, then you are not yours. If you are not yours, you cannot choose to do what you like to do. You cannot do because you are not you. You belong to God. And what God demands or requires, this is not legalistic, you know, like what the hyper charismatic Christians say. We are now liberated. We don't want to be legalistic. That's another extreme way of thinking where you dump everything saying, oh, all these are legalistic. No, it's not legalistic. If you read the entire Bible from the book of Matthew right up to the book of Revelation, it tells you to crucify your flesh. Right? Even the very last scripture in Revelation 22, 11, it says, He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is unclean, let him be unclean still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. A clear distinction is made even in the last book of the Bible. And the Bible also says, those who are gays, the lesbians, those who belong to the LGBT community, and those who are practicing sins, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scriptures are very clear. There's no compromise to it. There's no such thing as a, a gay pastor, gay bishop, gay church. No such thing. God is holy. Amen. God is holy. And there is no compromise. That does not mean God does not love those people. He loves them. You see, love does not mean he condones sin. Love is different from holiness. God loves everybody. He even loved, the Bible says, you know, when Judas Iscariot came to hug the Lord Jesus and kiss him, the scripture says, this is the most beautiful scripture in the entire Bible. It says, and the Lord Jesus loved him till the end. But that love did not save him from going to hell. Right? As far as the love of the Lord Jesus went, the Lord loved him. But he ended up in hell. You see? Similarly, the Lord loves 
every one of his creation. Because he died for them, you know. Who would do that? But you have a choice to accept or to reject. You have a choice to walk in the ways of righteousness or to walk in the ways of unrighteousness. God is not going to change his system of heavenly principles just because you choose an alternate lifestyle. You can have gender equality, you can change your restroom to have half male, half female symbol. You can do everything you like on this earth because this earth is in the control of Lucifer. In whatever way he wants, you can cross dress, straight dress, or no dress. <laughs> now it's happening, isn't it? Right? It's happening. Whatever. You know, recently I saw one of the amusing things. I hope you don't mind my giving you these simple examples. The one thing that amused me when I first came to the US was I saw some people wearing jeans with big holes <laughs> here, here, there. So, now this was in 91, okay? So I looked at them and said, oh my poor thing. This must be very poor people <laughs> who only have one pair of jeans. And they wore it until it has holes everywhere. I felt so sorry, you know, because, the reason is because, in India there are poor beggars who are dressed just like that. So I thought, oh my God, these people must be those beggarly kind, you know, they are dressed like that. Then later on, when I asked my host, so why these poor people, you know, is there anything the church is doing about these poor people. <laughs> so, the pastor was taken aback by what I said. Say, what do you mean poor people? I said, pastor, please look at them. See, one hole here, one hole there, one hole here. He started laughing. I asked him, why are you laughing? Oh, he said, brother, this is fashion. <laughs> oh, this is fashion. So when I went back to India, I told all the beggars, all you men are fashionably dressed. <laughs> so they were the original fashion trendsetters. <laughs> now, just uh, two weeks ago, I was very shocked to see a new kind of jeans that's, that's out on sale where only one small strip of have you seen that you know everything else is empty <laughs> scouts honor there you see there are witnesses there right everything else is empty there's pockets that covers your private parts and the buttocks are exposed and the best part of this the best part of the story is this that jeans retails for $168. For nothing, you are paying. <laughs> you are paying $168. You see, in this world, you can do anything you like. However, God has his system the kingdom of heaven. If you want to come to that kingdom, you must abide by the principles of heaven. Amen? And the principle of heaven is this. God is holy. Therefore, be you holy. That's it. There is no second standard about that. God is holy. I am holy. And you be holy. Amen. Period. Amen. There's no ifs or buts or commas or any room for negotiation. Amen. No negotiation. Amen. That is why very clearly 
the Lord God gave a final warning to the whole world. He that is filthy, let him continue to be filthy. That's what it says in the Greek. He that is unrighteous, let him continue to be unrighteous. He that is righteous, let him be more righteous. He that is holy, let him be more holy. You see, two groups. The church will split down the center. Because, you will agree with me, there are unrighteous people in the church, there are filthy people in the church, there are righteous people in the church, and there are holy people in the church. Agreed everybody? We have everybody all mixed together. The tares and the wheat all mixed together. The sheep and the goats all mixed together. But there is coming a time when God is going to draw one straight line. He said, no more compromise. He will divide his people into two groups. The righteous and the holy and the filthy and the unrighteous. And the invitation goes out, you choose which group you want to. You cannot, you know, you cannot create God in your own image thinking. Oh, God is love. So therefore, I am a gay. I am a lesbian. I am a queer person. Or whatever person. So you create an image, so God is also gay. Have you heard some teachings like that? That even says God or the Lord Jesus Christ is a gay? Because he was always mixing with the men and not with other people. Oh yeah, you know, these kind of funny teachings are everywhere. So the, you have a gay archbishop, you have a gay bishop, you have a gay pastor, you have a gay church, you have a lesbian archbishop, you have a lesbian bishop. You know, only the church of Jesus Christ, there's so much of mockery. You'll never find in a Muslim mosque, a gay priest. You will never find a Hindu temple, a gay priest. You will never find a Buddhist monk, a gay priest. Only in the church of Jesus Christ. There's so much of filth, so much of sin, so much of mockery. You know, the Bible says very clearly, God cannot be mocked at. Just because he is very patient, just because he is a God of long suffering, you cannot mock God. Because there will come a time when he will just turn his back and he will walk away. And when he walks away, no matter how much you cry, he will not come back. Let me give you three scriptural proofs for that. In Genesis, we read about Esau. For one bowl of broth, he sold his birthright. You know, he was very, very hungry. You know, they say, hungry as a bear. He was as hungry as a bear. And when Jacob offered him a solution, he totally forgot in a splitting moment, the needs of his flesh was more important than his birthright. A birthright is something you cannot be trading it because that's your gifting. So he traded it and the scripture says afterwards when he realized the foolishness of his mistake, he cried profusely but he did not regain his birthright. It was never restored back to him. That's number one. Number two, King Saul. We read in the Bible, King Saul was warned by the Lord and through the prophet Samuel time after time after time. And there came a time when the heart of King Saul was so hardened and his conscience was seared beyond the conviction of the Holy Spirit. 
And the scripture says, and the Holy Spirit left. Left King Saul. Right? He left him and never came back again. Thirdly, you read about Samson. Samson, like Esau, despised his anointing. He considered the calling of God, the special, peculiar, covenantal calling that God gave him, something to be very lightly treated. It was a secret covenant, you know. He's not supposed to share that secret with anybody. But for the lust of his flesh, he traded that secret. And as a result, the Holy Spirit left him. Though, now the good thing about this is, though, when he cried and repented for over a year, because it takes some time for the head to grow, you know. So about a year or longer, he cried and he repented. And he prayed sincerely, Lord, remember me one more time. Just one more time. And then he prayed, strengthen me one more time and let me die together with these people. And God answered his prayer and poured the anointing on his life and he was restored back to his anointing but he paid heavily with his life. He did not come back to his calling, right? He did not come back. He died. But he, the grace was extended to him. We should not end up like that. We should complete our calling. You should complete your destiny. You should not leave. You should not leave this world without completing your destiny. That's our calling. Because this is, you are the last generation. Have you seen track races? You, you people don't participate in athletics at all. <laughs> the look that you give me gives me the impression that you have never, you live in the wilderness all the time. <laughs> you know, track and, track and field, yeah, okay, all right, now you understand. Okay, among the many races in the track, there is a race called the relay race, where there is four person who runs around the stadium, and each person passes the baton, right? You remember that? Now, the first person starts the race and he passes the baton to the second person and if by chance he slips the baton there is still time to pick up the second person continues the race and he brings the baton to the third person and while he is passing the baton to the third person even if he drops the third person can pick it up and master courage to run but the third person, when he passes the baton to the fourth person, he cannot afford to drop the baton. Because the fourth person is the last runner. He will never get a second chance. The first person makes a mistake, he gets a second chance. Because of the second runner. The second person makes a mistake, he gets another chance because of the third runner. And if the third runner makes a mistake, there will never be another chance. Or that, I mean, there is still another chance because of the fourth runner. But if the fourth person drops the baton, he gets no chance. You are the fourth runner. You are the fourth runner. You are the last generation. There will not come another generation after you. You are the last runner. And in a relay race, athletics has been one of my forte when I was in high school, you know. So, but I am not a short distance runner. I am more a long distance runner. So, I run in the uh, a mile, the marathon, and the uh, see, I we use metric system 
Back in the East, you people don't use the metric system. So I'm trying to convert to yards and feet. I'm sorry, okay? The 1500 meters, the 2000 meters, and the 3000 meters. So those are my pet events. And then we do the relay. In the relay, we, we, the, there are two kinds of relay. One is the 4x100 and the 4x400. So this particular year, my final year in the school, so we were running in the 4x100, or 4x400, and I was the last runner in the relay race. And the first runner in a relay race, you know, the first and the last must be the best and the fittest. Because the first gives an impetus. He must be the best person. He must, must master all the strength, all the courage to give the boost. And then comes the last runner because he needs to cross the finishing line. So the first and the last must be the best. In the same manner, the first generation have given birth. Now you are the last generation. In the first generation, the birth took place on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2. Impetus, a big boom, the church was born. Then over the last 2000 years, we have drifted up and down, up and down, up and down to where we are today. This is the last race, the last generation. And one more time, God is going to give a boom, a boom effect to the body of Christ. A one more fresh Pentecost that's going to come upon the church, upon the individual. One more, one more. The one more Pentecost is going to come. In that Pentecost, it's not just the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's the nine, the seven spirits of God plus the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is called the perfect storm of the Holy Ghost. That's going to be poured out. So how much more we must prepare ourselves? You know, an athlete goes through many months of practice for one final showdown of an event that will last for just four minutes. You know, I ran in the marathon, or not in the marathon, a cross-country race. A cross-country race is three miles. For a three-mile race, I practice for one year. One year of practicing every day. Every day I go to this cross-country range and I practice. I run around and around the track, you know, just for one event of a three-minute event. I practice for one year. If just for a three-minute event you practice for one year, now you're going to live for a lifetime in heaven. How much more practice is required? Right? Not just a life in heaven, you know. You are going to abide with the consuming fire, with the devouring fire. You are going to abide with Him. In order for you to abide with Him, how can you be any lesser? In Amos chapter 3 verse 3 it says, How can two walk together if they not be agreed? In order for you to take hold of the hand of fire, your hand should be fiery. Right? Your hand should be of the same caliber. So that fire and fire. You cannot be wood, stubble or hay and put out your hand to hold the fire. You will burn to ashes. You must either be diamond, gold or silver. Not too bad, you know. Not too bad. Silver is still acceptable. Because silver, when purified by fire, it becomes purer silver. Gold becomes purer gold. Diamond, shinier. But the worst is wood, stubble or hay. 
if you are wood, stubble or hay, you will cease to exist. You will burn to ashes. So let's purpose in our hearts that we want to qualify ourselves to meet with God. Amen? So the principles that God gave us, sanctify. First is sanctify. Now the Old Testament concept of to sanctify is what is known today as fasting. So when the people say sanctify yourselves, they all know they should fast and pray. Joel chapter 2 verse 15. Sanctify a fast. Set apart yourselves. Don't do any other work. But just come and sit before God in sackcloth and ashes and wait on God. Let Him see your pathetic situation. You know, when people are fasting in these Old Testament days, they don't wear any other clothes. They wear a sackcloth. And you know, sackcloth is not comfortable. It's very rough and it pricks you here and there. And then they sit on not on a nice chair like how you all are sitting, not even on a carpet, but on ashes, which is which adds more discomfort. And they just sit there with a very, very sad, pathetic look. You know? And why do they do that? They want to show to God that they are truly repentant. They put away their luxury. They put away their comfort. They put away everything else. And they really mean business. See, that's what we should really come back to the ancient practices. That does not mean you take away all your clothes and you put wear sackcloth. You know? No, no, not that. The principle of it is not the methods. Methods varies from culture to culture, from time to time. But the principles never change. They are like immortal, perpetual. So what's the principle? The principle is humbling of the soul. That's the principle. To sanctify, to fast and to pray, you are humbling your soul. Psalms chapter 69 verse 10. Your soul must be humbled. Your heart must be humbled. Your mind must be humbled. You come before God in a state of humility. In a state of meekness. Why must the heart be sanctified? Because the Bible tells us three things concerning our heart. Number one, Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful more than anything else. Secondly, Proverbs chapter 6 verse 18 says, The heart is very wicked. And thirdly, Mark chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 says, That the heart is very unclean. So because the heart is unclean, it is wicked, it is deceitful, it must be brought into humility. It must be brought into a state of subjection, of humbleness before God. Because when God sees your heart, He sees it as wicked, deceitful and unclean. Now, to sanctify means to cleanse something from being unclean or defiled. So, to sanctify the heart means the heart has become defiled. How can the heart be defiled? The heart can be defiled through three ways. Number one, through thoughts. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says, The thoughts of our mind are full of wicked imaginations. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2 verse 15, that if you don't sanctify your mind, you don't clarify your mind. You don't cleanse your mind. When you come and stand before God on the judgment day, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, your mind, your thoughts 
will accuse you or excuse you. Either your thoughts, which is your soul, you know, your body, soul and spirit can exist in three forms, independent of each other. So, on the judgment day, your soul, which is your mind, comes and stands beside you and your body is standing there and it will accuse you before God. See, whatever you have thought all your life, let's say you are now 40 years old. So for 40 years of your life, any manner of unconfessed sins or unconfessed, unrighteous thoughts, impure thoughts, unclean thoughts, they all exist, you know. Your mind is like a hard disk. It stores everything. That's why it is very important to delete the files at the end of every day. You must have an app called Clean. You have that app on your computer? You do? Right? I have one app like that, you know. Every now and then it will pop up. Do you want me to clean your laptop? If you see, it will say so many files are there and redundant. Shall we, shall we clean? So if, we, if you click yes, it comes up and it goes around with a, with a broomstick to clean the hard disk. <laughs> In the same manner, listen everybody, before you retire every night, you must clean your heart, clean your mind, clean yourselves, examine for a moment your everyday happenings for the entire day. And if there be any unkind words that you have spoken, any rude words that you may have spoken, confess that. Before you go to bed, sanctify your heart, sanctify your mind. If not, the thing that you have spoken or thought, a word or deed, will be registered against you up in heaven. Let me give you one very, very uh, simple example. About six months ago, I visited my mother one day. And uh, when, when I visited her, she, we were talking. So she shared with me about, so that was a Sunday. So I asked her, how was your service your church service that morning. So she told me how the service was, what message the pastor preached, and then during the testimony time, she went up and she shared a testimony. So I asked her, what testimony did you share? So we had gone to Sri Lanka to do a three days meeting. So she came with us to the Sri Lanka meeting, and she testified to her church how she saw the people of Sri Lanka was so hungry, you know, it was raining cats and dogs that, day, that evening and not a single person left the meeting place, though they were all drenched to their skin. So she was so touched by seeing all that, she testified in the church, you know, the people of Sri Lanka, they are so hungry for the Lord, this and that. So I, when I heard that, I told her, this is not a testimony. She said, yes, it is a testimony. So we argued back and forth, you know. She would say yes, I would say no. She would say yes, I would say no. So at one, at one point, I raised my voice. I said, no, this is not a testimony. Because I'm the preacher, you know. My, my mother is just a mother. So it became a little not pleasant. Okay. It became a little unpleasant, so much so I felt the hurt in my heart. And I refused to eat the nice dinner she had cooked for me. So I said, no, I'm not eating dinner. I'm leaving right now. She was so sad. Poor mother, you know. She said, you know, if you want to be angry with me, why show the anger to the food? <laughs> Mothers have a way to talk, you know. I said, I'm showing my anger to you by not eating the food that you cooked. So I was about to walk away when my nephew came and made peace. He said, you know, uncle, poor mother, poor grandma, she has cooked nice food. Just eat. 
So I ate. So after that, um, I left the house. I didn't even say goodbye to her. You know? So I came back uh, to the hotel where I was staying. And um, before I retired for the night, I was meditating the scripture when the Lord Jesus visited me. He visited me and he asked me, So, how was your day today? <laughs> so I told the Lord whatever, whatever I did from the morning till the evening, you know. And then uh, he asked me a question. So, when I told him what I did from the morning to the evening, I skipped the part about <laughs> going to visit my mother. So, and then the Lord asked me, where were you this evening? <laughs> so I told him, I went to visit my mother and we had this discussion, Lord. So he looked at me and he said, you know, you were very, very prideful when you spoke with your mother. So I said, what do you mean I was prideful, Lord? You know what she said? <laughs> she was saying, she was just sharing or, but she said it was a testimony. This is what happened. And the Lord said, come, let's go and review the situation. The moment he said that, I was taken in the spirit and we entered into our, my mother's house. And we stood by the doorway and I saw myself seated on the sofa and my mother was seated there. And now I saw myself together with the Lord Jesus. And the Lord said, now look at the situation. Now, I'm looking at the situation from the spiritual point of view, rather than from the natural point of view. And at every sentence that I spoke, the Lord told me, look at what you spoke. Look what comes from your heart. See the pride that came out of your heart. Though it is just a mother-son conversation, but now I'm not an ordinary son. I have a spiritual stature. So in my spiritual stature, I cannot have my records condemned. So the Lord showed me, see how pridefully you have spoken. So I, I, I was still wondering, you know, how Lord, how can you call that prideful? So I, instead of saying that, I asked him like this, Lord, please show me, how was I prideful? And the Lord said, whenever, now that day, the Lord taught me something about Sharing our opinions. He said, whenever you put yourself higher and put another person's opinions lower, that is pride. That is pride. If you just talk on the same level, sharing, that is not, that's just discussion. But when you begin to suppress someone, when you say that I know better, that my opinions are better than yours, that is pride. That is pride. So that day I knelt on and I repented before the Lord. I said, Lord, please forgive me for my prideful heart. So after that, so the, so then he asked me, what are you going to do about this right now? I said, Lord, I will call my mother and ask for her forgiveness. So as soon as the visitation ended, the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call my mother. And mothers are always very gracious, you know. They said, oh, it's okay, son. It's all right, son. And the following day, I went to visit her. I bought her a gift. You know, you, <laughs> you have to offer a peace offering, right? <laughs> so, your thoughts. Examine your thoughts. Number two. Oh. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 24 verse 16 that our conscience must be free of offenses. Don't keep, don't harbor any offense in your mind. Let it go. Let it go. Secondly, words that you speak, they defile your heart. My, Matthew chapter 12 Verses 34 to 37. It says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that the words that comes out of your mouth, 
whether unkind words, prideful words, arrogant words, is because your heart is arrogant. Your heart is prideful. Because your heart is arrogant, prideful, your mouth speaks. So your, the words of your mouth defiles your heart. Thirdly, deeds. Deeds, actions. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Now if you will turn your Bible with me to Mark chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, it says like this, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, see, first, is, first it says, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Now what those evil thoughts produce? Adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Twelve kinds of deeds that defiles your heart. And verse 23 says, All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Say they come from your heart. Before your hand does the work of stealing. Your heart first conceives the thought. Before your body commits a sin of adultery. Your heart first lusts adultery. Just like King David, for an example. In 2 Samuel chapter 11. Before he slept with Bathsheba, the Bible says he loitered on his rooftop and he accidentally saw a woman bathing. Accidental is not a sin. But an accidental became a gaze. You know, accidental, right? You see, you should just walk away. But if you... Oh, 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 oh. Or if you take a binoculars... Mm. <laughs> see? The more he looked, the more he began to fantasize in his heart. And eventually... Even though he knew she was another man's wife, because his heart was already full of adultery, he couldn't care less about whose wife she was. He just slept with her. See, it all began in the heart. So the heart defiles. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, and Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. An impure and unclean heart cannot see God. So, if you are longing to have a visitation from the Lord Jesus, I'm sure if I would ask you a question right now, how many of you like to see the Lord Jesus? Every hand will go up, right? But the Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are they who are pure in the heart, for they shall see God. So the reason why we are not able to see is because there's some kind of impurity still in our hearts. We can feel the presence, don't you? You see, we are clean only that much. To just feel the presence. We could feel the presence. See, uh, let me illustrate like this. Let's suppose there is a campfire here. Even when you move away from a long distance, you can still feel the heat from the fire, right? But when you get closer, but standing at the distance, feeling the heat is different from being in the fire, right? In the same manner, you are standing far away. You could feel the presence of God. But that is not as seeing the glory of God. 
And the reason we can just simply feel and not see is because we are far away from the ark of the covenant. We are far. We need to come closer. And the closer you come, the stronger the fire will burn. Right? The fire will burn the stronger. And the Holy Spirit will prompt you or convict you the stronger. And what may seem inconsequential when you want to come closer and closer and closer the inconsequential may seem like a huge mountain of sin let me give you one good example there lived a wonderful man of God in China in the 50s called John Sung he was so powerfully anointed by God his anointing was like John the Baptist. You know, he called out sin and he re- calls, he preaches message of repentance and the fire of God will be so strong upon him, people have literally seen him all aflame in fire. And the wooden floor on which he would be standing, when he lives after preaching, the people have seen the entire wood burned as if fire had burned. That was the anointing upon his life. Now towards the end of his life, I think a year before he died, one day he was praying and he heard the Holy Spirit say, John Sung, you are a thief. And John was so shocked. He said, Lord, what do you mean I'm a thief? I've never taken any offering. I've never taken anybody's money. Even when I go to preach in a church, I, nev- I don't even receive any offering. Even whatever the people gives, my wife collects them. I don't touch any money. When I am living such a clean life, how can I be a thief, Lord? Then the Holy Spirit told him, Do you know, five years ago, you borrowed five cents from that particular pastor. And you promised the pastor you will return back that five cents. But till today, you have not returned the five cents. So John Sung, you are a thief. Now, how big is five cents? Not big, right? You can hardly buy anything with, with five cents, right? Even if you go to the supermarket, they have a big bowl where you put all your, they ask you to put all the pennies there. Right? See, pennies are no more u- useful, you know. But, the closer you get to the fire, the stronger the fire burns to purify you so that every unclean things must be cleansed, must be sanctified if you want to dwell with the devouring and consuming fire. Purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. Without holiness, it is impossible to see God. Now earlier on I shared with you about my discussion with my mother. It's just mother, son, talk, you know. Okay, in the past, now this is something I must tell you. The way that I had talked with my mother, that was not new. I'm not a good son, you know. I have talked with her like that, I should say, all my life. And, you know, but never, never have the Lord ever corrected me like that. But, Remember I shared with you an experience I last night where I, I was taken to see the Father God? After that experience, everything changed in my life. The Lord began to demand a greater degree of holiness and a greater degree of consecration. Ever since then, I see all these things change. See, what's happening is, I'm being brought closer and closer to that devouring fire. So when you want to dwell with the devouring fire, Psalms 15 and Psalms 24 tells us, you must sanctify yourself. Your hands must be clean. Your lips must be clean. Your feet must be clean. It must be undefiled so that you can dwell, climb up the holy tabernacle, climb up the holy hill and dwell in the tabernacle and dwell with the devouring fire. So you want to sanctify yourselves. 
Now when you fast, when you sanctify, when you fast and pray, Psalms 35 verse 13 says, it will produce an effect of humbleness in your heart. You will be humbled before the presence of the Lord. Secondly, God told the prophet Moses, have the people wash their clothes. In Exodus chapter 19 verse 10 and 14. Now this may sound very strange in the 21st century. Because almost every day we change our clothes. We change our clothes and we wash our clothes. If not every day, at least every other day or at least once a week. So nobody, no pastor needs to tell you here and tell you, folks, wash all your clothes. And when you come to church on Sunday, be in your best clothes. No pastor need to do that because every day you come in new clothes. Except me. <laughs> you see, when I, when I see you, I don't see you wearing the same clothes that you wore yesterday. Like that, that black brother. Yesterday he was wearing a blue shirt. Today he's wearing a white shirt. Right? So I cannot call you that black brother with the blue shirt. Right? <laughs> So, but that was not the case with the Israelites. Now, when they were in the wilderness, there's nowhere they could wash their clothes every day. They couldn't because there was scarcity of water. And so God specifically told them, wash their clothes. So how does this apply to us? How can we apply this principle? The word wash in the Hebrew is kabak, K-A-B-A-C. And the word kabak means to trample, wash by the stomping of the feet. Now this concept is very difficult for us to understand in our modern culture because we don't see our washing machine stomping, right? It just do the tumbling. But if you can, if you have ever seen any documentaries, in the olden days, the people, you know, they bring their clothes to the sea, riverside and they just beat their clothes by a stone or they will just stamp with their feet. Have you seen all that? Ah, if you have seen all that, you are as old as the dinosaurs. <laughs> so, so that's the concept of washing. Why do we need to wash? Because clothes get dirty. Now you will read in Genesis chapter 35 verse 2. God told Jacob, go to Bethel and make an altar. So that was a command given by God. And when they came to Bethel, before Jacob set up an altar to worship God, he told his family and all his servants, to wash their clothes and to change their clothes. You are now coming before God. You know, one amusing thing is this, you know. When people come to church on a Sunday, they are dressed in their Sunday best. But when they come to a weekday meetings like this, they dress as if they are going to a beach party. <laughs> Don't laugh, please. This is what you do. Don't laugh. So I always used to wonder what makes Sunday very special because even during weekdays you are coming into the church you are coming to meet with God. Does God only come to meet you on a Sunday? Doesn't He meet you on a Thursday? Doesn't meet you on a Friday? Doesn't He meet you on a Saturday? So why are you only dressed best on a Sunday? When the other days, you couldn't care less. Doesn't God show up? You see, the problem is the attitude of our heart. See, we need to change all these attitudes before we can meet with God. We must totally repent of every idiotic practices, unholy 
ungodly practices in our lifestyle. If you honestly look at your life and look at the way we have been living, there are so many ungodly things we are doing. And yet, we are hoping and praying that the glory of God will manifest. How can it manifest when there's so much of filth in our midst? When we, when we have no reverence for God, how can He manifest? We hardly scratch even the shadow of the presence of God. And yet we pride ourselves, oh, the service was so anointed today. Oh, it was so glorious. You know, I tell you very honestly with great love, Whatever you pride yourself saying, oh, the service is so anointed, is nothing. You have not even touched the shadow of the presence of God. When God wants to physically manifest His glory in your midst, that is His ultimate best. But we are not ready. We don't prepare ourselves to meet Him. When we don't prepare ourselves to meet him, how can he come? If he came, it will kill you. His glory will kill you. So in his great goodness, he refrains from coming. He just sends his presence. Let me give you a very good scriptural proof for that. In Exodus chapter 24, God told Moses, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. So the original intent of God was for the tabernacle to be in the midst, in the middle of the people. That was his original intention. But because the children of Israel broke the covenant they made with God, by making a golden calf, and bowing down and worshipping and committing fornication at the bottom of Mount Sinai, the very place where they had made a covenant with God. And when Moses broke the Ten Commandments, God told Moses, I will not dwell in your midst anymore. Set the tabernacle outside from where the people are gathered. See, God no more dwell in their midst. He moved his presence far away. And then he told Moses, tell the people, I will no more dwell in their midst because they have sinned against me. So now, if they want to see me, let them come and see me outside the camp. Number one. Number two, God told Moses, I will no more walk in your midst. So Moses fell on his face before God and he cried and he cried and he cried. And then the Lord, because of Moses' cries, the Lord said, My presence will go with you, but not me. I will not walk in your midst because you have defiled yourself. You see, there's a difference, you know, between the manifested presence of God and the presence of God. There's a big difference. And the presence of God is what we normally feel in our churches, in our gatherings, in our meetings. We feel the goosebumps all over and we jump up and down, being so exhilarated by the goosebumps. But it's goosebumps are just goosebumps. It's, not, it's just the presence, you know. It's just like the breeze that blows. See, there's a big difference between the force of the breeze and the force of a wind. Right? It's just a gentle breeze. The presence is just like a gentle breeze. So why are we settled for a gentle breeze when the, the force of the wind can come in our midst? See, that is why God has called me to share these messages with you to prepare for a visitation. So that now we can know where we have gone wrong. We can unlearn many things and put things right in our life. Put things right in our church. Reordain, rebuild 
our churches, our ministries, our lives, our families on the right foundation that God had purpose for His church to be. Amen! The garment of salvation and the rope of righteousness. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10. That is given to us when you were saved should always be kept white. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 8 tells us like that. You receive from God a clean white garment. And it is our duty to keep it clean. Keep it white all the time. Unfortunately, in our everyday walk of life, we get the garment soiled. We read that in Revelation chapter 3 verse 4. When the Lord Jesus looked at the church in Sardis and he told the people in Sardis, you are alive but you are dead. You are physically alive but spiritually you are dead. Then the Lord Jesus said, but there are some in your midst who have kept your garments white. Only some, not all. Some, you have kept your holiness. You have kept your purity. You kept, you guarded your garment from getting soiled. The Bible tells us in Jude verse 23, how the garment can be soiled. The garment can be soiled by the flesh. Now what is the flesh? Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 details 17 kinds of the works of the flesh that can soil the garment that we are wearing. So it can soil the garment. When they are soiled, you cannot stand before God in that stage. Let me give you two examples. In Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4, we read the high priest Joshua. He comes and stands before God and his garments were all filthy. Before he can continue to stand before God's presence, an angel will give the command, remove his clothes and put on him new clothes. So the old, soiled, sinful clothes, filthy clothes must be removed. That's number one. Number two, in Luke chapter 15, verse 22, the prodigal son, when he came to his senses and he came back to his father's house, the Bible says, as soon as the father had hugged the son and kissed him, before the son can be brought to the father's house, the first thing the father said is, change his clothes. Put on him a new robe. Why? Because he was wearing a filthy garment. And what is the filthy garment? Worldly defilement. Because of his mixture with the world, with the practices of the world, with the things of the world, his garment has been soiled. His garment has been defiled. Before he can enter into the father's house, the garments must be changed. So how do you wash your spiritual clothes? You can wash your natural clothes. How do you wash your spiritual clothes? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26 says, Apply the water of God's word to wash your clothes. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can wash your clothes. In John chapter 13, verse 10, He washed the feet of the disciples and He said, All of you are clean. And He said, My word will clean you. So every day, before you retire to the pit, you need to examine yourself whether your actions have been defiled, whether there were any acts of Pride acts of anything according to the 17 works of the flesh. 
if there's anything you want to repent, you want to ask the Holy Spirit to wash you clean. In that way, you are washing your spiritual garment that it will always be clean and white in the presence of God. You know, in the Old Testament, when people bring their sacrifices before the priest, the priest was told to examine the sacrifice for any defilement. If the sacrifice is all clean, then he's supposed to offer the sacrifice. If even there's a small black spot on a sheep or on a turtle dove or anything, that sacrifice or that animal is rejected. So, what should we do? Psalms 26 verse 2. Lamentation chapter 3 verse 40. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 28. Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 tells us, Ask God to examine you. When you stand before God, you ask the Lord Jesus, Lord, examine me. Try me. See my heart, Lord. See my mind, Lord. See my life. If there be any sin, if there be any defilement, show me Holy Spirit. If you ask, the Holy Spirit will show you the words that you spoke or the thoughts that you thought or the actions that you did throughout the day and show you where defilement had taken place. Just like I told you the example about me and my mother's conversation. The Lord Jesus in his kindness came and showed me where I was wrong. If he had not corrected me that day, I would have continued in my foolishness to always talk with my mother. Like that, you know. So from after that experience, I de decided to zip, zip, zip my mouth. And I learned one thing, you know. How many times we have acted in pride by suppressing another person's opinion. See? Whenever, you know what is pride? Pride is always lifting up yourself and putting another person down. That's what pride is. So whenever you lift up yourself and say, I am better than you, that is pride. Whenever you say, my opinion is better than you, that is pride. When you say, I know better than you, that is pride. I'll give you one very good example. You know, I'm sure you all are watching good Christian teachings on YouTube. Don't you? Now if you look at some of those teachings in YouTube and you scroll down, you'll find a lot of commands people make. Right? Sometimes when I read the commands, it shows the exact attitude of pride. Because everybody say, no, I, am, I know better than the speaker. My opinion is better. No, he's talking rubbish. Ah, oh, you know some of the comments that I read about me. Those pe the people who made the comment, they hardly know who I am, and they hardly know what I'm doing, but they just write anything they like. See, that is pride, the pride of our heart, that always will lift yourself up higher and put another person low down. I'll give you one very good example before we close this, uh, this topic, not this subject. Two men, the Lord Jesus said, went to pray. One was a tax collector, another was a Pharisee. So they were standing side by side. And the Lord Jesus said, and the Pharisee, I mean the tax collector, was so convicted in his heart. He dared not lift up his head and look at the presence of God. He just bowed his head and he said, Lord, I'm a great sinner. I'm a great sinner. I'm a great sinner. That was all he was saying. He dare not, could not bring himself up to say anything more. And the tax collector was standing by this side and he was just looking at this man. You know, you know the Pharisee. Pharisee, you know, they are the bishops, the pastors. The pastors of today were the Pharisees of yesterday. <laughs> and vice versa, you know. 
that same spirit exists today the pharisee spirit it's it's prevalent they don't disappear no they continue from generation to generation so today the pharisee have another title called reverend bishop archbishop reverend doctor some reverend doctor 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 <laughs> so many doctors if everybody becomes doctors who is going to be a patient <laughs> so so he was looking up and down oh this man's prayer does not add up to theology there's no theology in you what kind of prayer are you praying and he had such a snobbish look and he looked up to heaven and he said now listen this is what he prayed lord i thank you i am not like this man that was his prayer you know he did not say lord i fast three times a day i pray three times a day he didn't say like that he said lord i am not like him and the lord jesus said that attitude was an attitude of pride when you compare yourself with somebody and you promote yourself you lift yourself higher and you're looking down another person that is pride when you write your opinion and expressing your opinion is better than somebody that is pride you know that's why the lord jesus said let your words on this earth be few and the lord jesus gave us a remedy he said just let it restrict it to two words yes and no so next time anybody ask you any question yes <laughs> no <laughs> see the amount of offenses that can be saved right and better still the amount of money you can save on telephone bills <laughs> all your conversation yes no soon or later the other person talking to you will get sick and tired of you <laughs> they'll say bye <laughs> number 3 principle number 3 now the the single people will have a difficult time trying to understand this as much as i had a very hard time trying to understand this until the lord really taught me what it really meant the principle number 3 god told the prophet moses tell the people don't let the husbands come near their wives let them abstain from sexual relationships exodus chapter 19 verse 15 now for a long time i could not grasp why god would say that because the entire sexual union was it originated from god it was god who told the first man and the first woman come together be fruitful and multiply so the concept of sexual union was taught to adam by god no no one else so if, if anything that comes from god it's always good everybody agrees because all creation every time god created something said it's good it's good it's good so if if it is all good then why did god say abstain from sexual relationships it's okay for husbands and wives what about singles how are they going to they are already abstaining all their lives so what further to abstain then there's something more to it now what is the sexual act the sexual act the bible tells us in second corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 to 15 is a union it's not just two physical bodies coming together not just a body you know see the bible says and the two shall become one it's not just the body is the soul 
the two souls becoming entwined, becoming one. That is why the Bible says, of when a man is joined to his wife, let him leave his father's house and be joined together with his wife. I have observed families, you know, a, a girl or a man, they are brought up by loving parents. And the parents pour, pour out so much of love, so much of care, and so much of uh, deeds upon their children. And they bring them up to be fine young men and women. And then when they reach an age where they are going to look for their own life partners, and when they find a life partner, during the period of courtship, and they are getting to know one another, another, sometimes they are, not sometimes, most of the times they are madly in love. And when they are madly in love, they are really mad. <laughs> they are really mad, you know. Because logic doesn't work anymore. Am I right, everybody? Logic doesn't work. That's why they say love is blind. It's not only blind, it's deaf, dumb, and stupid. <laughs> Those of you who have gone through and come out, you will agree with me. Right? Okay. Anyway, now, after marriage, something changes in the heart and the mind of these two persons. Suddenly, the father and mother who had brought them up for 25 years does not, doesn't matter anymore. The wife and the husband becomes more important than the parents who has slot to bring them up. I have seen this over and over in many, many families, you know. So I used to wonder, what caused the change? Why suddenly? How can a sudden new relationship that just came a year ago can be more important than a father and mother who have brought you up for 25 years? What caused the change? Until I found the scripture where it says, the two shall become one. And the thing is, during the sexual union, the two souls becomes one. And it is during that time, the spiritual umbilical cord between the daughter and her mother, and her son and his mother is cut. It is cut, and another new umbilical cord is bound between the husband and the wife. That's the meaning of the scripture, and the two shall become one. Their soul becomes one. It is alienated, it's now cut off from the maternal instincts, and they become one. You know, every sexual act produces that. So if you go around sleeping, don't love. If you go around sleeping with many partners, you know how many times your soul is getting united? Your soul is getting united with this woman, your soul is getting with that. Finally, until you get married. Let's say a person has slept with many person. You know how many times their soul has been united and united and united? And their soul is so corrupted. Very, very defiled. So many soul ties goes inside you. That's the reason why marriages don't last in the US. Because you have been sleeping around. The concept of virginity is almost as extinct as the dinosaurs in today's society. Am I right everybody? It is it is a rarity for a, a young man or a young woman to be a virgin until the day of their marriage. It's an unfashionable thing today. Am I right? It's an unfashionable thing. If you are a virgin, something's wrong with you. That's why high school students talk about, right? Now you don't need to go to high school, even in elementary school. They are losing their virginity. Thanks to the internet, you know. 
Now you don't need to go to any pawn shop to watch any pawn things. It's all there. Right in your living room. Or right in your children's bedroom. And many of the pawn videos, they are free on the YouTube. And your kids, without your supervision, they are learning everything on the internet. Defilement. Before their body gets into the physical act, their mind and their hearts are already filled with this filth. Now today we heard from Pastor White about the shooting that took place in Texas. Now why? You know, I was sitting there, I was wondering, and I was pondering in my heart, Lord, why is it continuously this thing is happening in the U.S., Lord? Time after time after time. Why is this happening? But look at all the movies that are coming out of Hollywood. What are they teaching you? Take the gun. Right? Then look at the computer games that your children are playing. It's all full of violence. Day and night, your children are exposed to violence. So, they enact what they have been fantasizing. The physical act of shooting took place in their heart first. Through the computer games. They are killing one another. And they are watching all these Hollywood movies. Look at the, you know, have you ever found a good, decent Hollywood movie? No, gone are the days of Tom and Jerry, you know. See, all those who are laughing, you are as old as the dinosaurs. <laughs> because today's kids will not know anything about Tom and Jerry. Look at the cartoons today. Even the cartoons, there is sex. There is violence. Innocency is gone, you know. So our little children, from, from a young age, they are exposed to anything that is filthy. I was just looking at my notes two days ago and I, and I saw a prophecy that I once gave to the US about four years ago. And I was shocked to see the things that have happened now got revealed to me four years ago. Among one of them was this nation will pass the same sex marriage law. That came to pass in the year 2015. And gays will be appointed to government officers. They will be senators. They will be congressmen. They will be in important positions of power. Has it come to pass? Yes. It has come to pass. Thirdly, children will be taught in schools about an alternate lifestyle. Has that come to pass? Yes. See, all that has come to pass. So, when you have kicked God out of your schools, what has come in? The devil has come in now. So, instead of... Uh, now, I'm not uh, saying what you did was wrong, Pastor Gwent. Instead of praying... For the suffering families in Texas who lost their kids. You know what is the better response you should do? You should fall on your face and repent before God for kicking Bibles out of your schools. For kicking prayer out of your schools. You should fall on your face and repent before God. And after repentance... Now you must get on your knees and battle with the spirits of violence that has invaded your schools, invaded our young people. That's what you should be doing. Of course, we should sympathize and empathize with the bereaving and grieving parents. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. But there is a larger problem. The larger problem is 
you must now repent for the sins of the land. Even the Christians have been involved in kicking prayer out of schools. You kept quiet. All the churches in the US, you kept quiet. You held your peace when your government passed the rule to kick prayer out of the schools, to kick Bible out of the school, but they introduced witchcraft in the schools. Witchcraft is allowed, sex is allowed, but Bible is a very damnable, sinful thing. Am I right? You know, in the 40s, in the 50s, or even way before that, America was a very, very godly Christian nation. Not anymore. Not anymore. You are very, very heathen. You are worse than a Hindu nation. You are worse than a Muslim nation. You have absorbed all the idols that the heathen nation world have given up. I'm sorry to say this, but this is the truth. There are more idols in the land of the U.S. than outside the U.S. You have allowed all this to come into this land to defile your holy destiny, your holy calling. Just like how Israel has done in the past, you have done it. So you must do much, much more repenting for allowing all this filth in your nation. And God has given you one chance now in the form of President Trump. God brought you one godly man. Never mind about his uncultured way of talking. No, never mind. Because you need that kind of an uncultured way to handle this kind of a stubborn society. Right? You need, um, you, you need a no-nonsense man like him to put things back in order. Amen. So every day of your life, you thank God for President Donald Trump. And it is your bounden duty to pray for his safety. You know, I have been watching ever since Mr. Trump took office. There hasn't been a single day where he was not attacked. Am I right? From every nook and corner, he has been attacked. And you know what is the purpose of the attack? To kick him out of the office. That is the purpose. Now, I don't condone whatever sins he has done. You know? But look, the, the recent incident about him with a, one of the playboy prostitute, you know? When I look at it from a logical point of view, now again, let me say, I'm not condoning it. From looking at a logical point of view, that incident took place before he became the president. It was before. It was in the past. It was not like Bill Clinton who committed adultery fornication with his intern when he was in office. Now you tell me how much was Bill Clinton punished? He went scot-free, right? Now you have Mr. Trump who has done something in the past, why bring it into the present? The sole purpose is to shame him, to humiliate him, to paint a dark black image of him that he's unfit to be the president and then kick him out. Now it is, let me repeat to you one more time. I said that last year and I said that one more time. He is God's gateway for you. God's gateway. He is God's portal. Through Him. Because a righteous man is standing in the nation. You now have a righteous king. 
as far as the eyes of God is concerned, a righteous king. And when a righteous king is in the land, he will effect righteousness in the land. And the Bible also says, righteousness will spring forth from the land. So, you must pray ardently. And our pastor White has initiated a presidential prayer watch. I hope you all are part of that prayer watch. If you have not, please maybe pastor you can say something about that later on and then you, you all must sign up to pray for your president's safety. The Lord showed me last year when I was standing here and praying that witches have formed a 24 hour prayer watch to put curses on him. You know, if witches can do that, how much more the people of God should do a 24 hour prayer watch. So please pray for your president. He is God's last chance for you. Like I told you last year, he must complete his office so that the days of grace extended for you will be completed. And if during these days of grace you put all things right, then another four years of grace will be extended for you. And you will rise up one more time as a superpower nation, like a ship nation. You know, all the, from the year 1948 till now, none of your US presidents have done a thing that Mr. Trump has done. That is moving the embassy to Jerusalem. You tell me, which other US president had the guts, the boldness to do that, than Mr. Trump? See, God carefully handpicked a man of the caliber, the stubbornness like Mr. Trump, to put in the office so that he cared less what the world says. He couldn't care less. And you should also thank God for the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. I'm sure you all know that she's also a godly Christian. Now she has the same nature like Mr. Trump, a no-nonsense character. So thank God for these wonderful leaders that God has given to you. And it is your great duty to pray. You know, before the elections, when I was taken up to heaven, and when Abraham told me that Mr. Trump will be like King Cyrus, who will be a friend and a protector to Israel, I didn't understand its complexity, you know. But until recently, when I did an in-depth study about King Cyrus, then I found out King Cyrus was instrumental in doing two things. One, he was instrumental for the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Secondly, he was also instrumental in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. So which means, Mr. Trump has done one thing now. Rebuilding Jerusalem by moving the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And to complete his destiny as Cyrus, which means he will also be instrumental in rebuilding the third temple. Amen. That is why it is very, very imperative 
that he completes his term. He must complete his term. So please do not take your liberty for granted. You must fervently pray and intercede for Mr. Trump. Sometimes he's making bad decisions. So you must pray that he will be surrounded with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that the chief prince angel of God for your nation will can influence him, can inspire him with counsels from heaven so that he's always making the right decisions. Amen. So, put away sexual relationships. Abstain from sexual relationship. And as I said, when God created man, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he says, God created man alone just for himself. I, the next statement that I make, I hope all my dearly beloved sisters and daughters will not get offended. It's not something offensive. Oh, I'm a male chauvinist. Not that. I'm just, we are looking strictly from the Bible, okay? Originally, there was no plan for women in the creation. God made men. He made women because he saw that Adam was feeling lonely. But originally, if Adam had put his perspective right and yoked his heart right with God in the first place, there wouldn't be a creation of Eve. Agreed, everybody? All you women, you still love me? Okay. So now, follow this train of thought that I'm leading you. So, if there was no woman, there wouldn't be this thing called sex. So, man would have been all his entire life totally dedicated, sanctified, and abandoned to loving God and worshipping God. Are you with me? Yes. Now, carry this thought. Now, you come into a marriage relationship. So in a marriage relationship, now you are delineating from that oneness that God originally created. Now you have to share yourself with another. That's okay. God allows that. But then he says, when you are consecrated, I want you all for me. No sharing. You are all for me. Because he says, I am a jealous God. You are all for me. That is why God calls you abstain from sexual relationship and set yourself apart so that you are wholly mine. You have no other distraction. You give yourself completely to seek me. This is the counsel the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 7 verse 5 he says, Except for prayer and fasting, don't stay away from sexual relationship. Now this is within the family context. So when you're fasting and you're praying, it is an acceptable thing to abstain from sexual relationship. And the Bible also further tells in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3, Abstain from sexual lusts. Now that pertains to the single people. Abstain. You know, whether we like it or not, our body has a biological clock. And when it reaches a certain age, you will yearn, you will have the sexual instincts. You want to pro for procreation. But until the day of marriage, we are counseled, abstain from sexual lusts. Don't be yoked with another. Don't. Because when you yoke, when you have sexual relationship outside marriage, you are trading a part of your soul to another woman or to another man. And if you have slept with many persons, 
many partners, a part of your soul is each time is taken and given to somebody else. And then eventually, you are not a complete you. Something of you has already been lost. Now, concerning this union, now we look at it from a spiritual point of view. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, Friendship with the world is like committing adultery. So when you are very deeply involved in the things of the world, then you are married to the world. You're not even married, you are fornicating with the things, with the pleasures of the world. So stay away from all this. So what, what is it really trying to get us into? Don't give your heart to another God. That's what it is. In Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 3, we read about sexual immorality that was practiced by Israel and how the anger of God manifested to destroy them. Now, in, as in the last days, as we are today, there is going to come an avalanche of sexual perversion in the church. How is it? Revelation chapter 2 verse 20, it says, the spirit of Jezebel will begin to manifest in the church in the form of a prophet or a prophetess. That's how she will manifest. She will not just manifest. See, many people mistakenly call an overbearing woman or a man as they have the spirit of Jezebel. No, just because someone is very strong natured, they are not Jezebel. Like a woman, women have tremendous leadership abilities. So are everybody Jezebel? No, right? If you read Proverbs chapter 31, look at all the fine qualities of a woman there. And it says she's the first one to get up before the sun comes up. And she's the last person to go to sleep even after the sun has gone to sleep. But look at where the man is sitting. He's a lazy bum. <laughs> he's just sitting by the gates of the city and talking stories. <laughs> All you women must give a big clap to yourselves right now. And the women are so hardworking, while the men are lazy bums. Like a lazy dog that sleeps the whole day. That's what the men are doing. This is what the Bible says about a woman. And very true. They all have tremendous leadership skills. It takes great skill. It takes great management principles to manage two kids. To manage a household. She is an uneducated MBA degree holder. Because she's managing everything, you know. Now, just because a woman is very strong in leadership, or she is a leader, that is not the works of a Jezebel. Although, it is one of the manifestation. But the clear, the main identifying attribute of the Jezebel spirit is she or he is a prophesizer. They will exhibit the gifts of prophecy or prophetic revelations and they will claim to have supernatural revelation from God. Now what is the fruit of that? The fruit the Bible tells us is they will Teach the people of God to commit sexual fornication. Now what is sexual fornication? Jude verse 7 tells us, is going after strange flesh. Now what is strange flesh? Strange doctrines. Strange teachings. Just like I gave you an example last night. This grave soaking. That is... Teachings from the pit of hell. You know, 
what lies in the graveyard? Evil spirits. Right? Evil spirits are lying in the graveyards. And you go and lie on a tombstone. See, let me tell you one thing, okay? When Mary Magdalene went to embalm the body of the Lord Jesus, the angel who met her asked her, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? A righteous man, no matter how anointed a man of God may be, only his body is lying in the grave. The anointing on his life, on his spirit, is now up in heaven. It's not there anymore. If it's not there anymore, you are wasting your time sleeping in the grave or soaking. You're just lying on a cold stone slab. It's nothing. And whatever anointing you will claim that you receive is not truly from God. It is from the evil one. You know, this afternoon, when I was waiting on God, the Lord suddenly spoke to me about gates of hell. And, you know, hell is one thing I've it's never been my subject that I have sought after. But he just spoke to me, he said, gates of hell are going to be released and opened in many places in this world today. And one of the manifestation when they are open is there will be an infiltration in the churches of such unbiblical practices. Such demonic teachings will come into the church where you will say, I'm smoking the Holy Ghost by taking drugs. Have you heard of that? That, that was prevalent some years ago. You know, some preachers rose up who were previously drug addicts and then they start smoking joint and they said, oh, I'm smoking the Holy Ghost. When they were literally taking drugs. You know, what mockery you are doing and how much you are insulting the holiness of God and the great grace of God that did not kill you for speaking like that. And now, it has surpassed to getting anointing from the graveyards, from the tombstones. Please stay far away from all this. I show you a better way. Don't lie on the gravestone, but bend your knees and you fast and you pray. Break your heart. Bend your knees. Seek the face of God and you will receive a powerful anointing of the powers of the last days to come. So finally, after having cleansed ourselves, sanctifying ourselves and washing our clothes, abstaining from sexual lust, what should we do next? The fourth thing, passionately seek God with all your heart. Passionately seek God with all your heart. Psalms 27 verse 4. One thing have I desired and one thing I will seek after. That should be your all-consuming passion. You know, many good Christians, seeking Christians, they desire a visitation, but they're not getting it. And I have wondered over the years, so I wondered why is it that these wonderful, nice Christians, they're desiring, but they're not getting. Why? It contradicts what the Lord told me, my desire to my, manifest myself to them is greater than they des their desire to see me. And I made an analysis 
of many believers. And then I came to a conclusion why they were not getting a visitation. Because they simply wish and they don't act upon their desire. God is not a wishing well, you know. You just stand by the well, drop a coin, and you wish, I wish. I wish. No. You should not be a wisher. The Bible says, they who seek God early will find Him. You must seek, passionately seek Him. Like what King David says, one thing I have desired. He not only desired, he said, I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of God all the days of my life. That was his passionate goal. Not just a desire. He pursued after that. Which meant he did his homework. He was praying day and night. Day and night. He wouldn't let God go until he got what he wanted. And the Bible tells us, God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. Amen. It's not one day praying, two days praying, one week praying, two weeks praying. Keep on praying until you get it. Amen. Keep on. Keep on. Don't stop until you get it. Amen. The problem with us is, we fall short just before the door is open. You stop. You know, in the Greek, the scripture, ask and it shall be given unto you, says like this, keep on asking. In the Greek, it is a present continuous tense. Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. You must keep on doing it until God opens the door. And the moment He opens the door, it is open for good. It will never be closed to you again. And you can go in and come out whenever you like. That is the best part until the door is open. And that's exactly what the prophet Moses himself did. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 24, verse 12 to 13, and verse 15 and verse 16, that he passionately sought God before God manifested himself and caught him up in glory. And the Bible also says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 2 and 4, he always rises up very early to seek God. And Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17, and Psalms chapter 63, verse 1 says, those who seek him early shall find him. Have you heard of this proverb or adage that says, the early bird finds the worm? <laughs> so you be the early bird, but don't be the angry bird. <laughs> Poor bird, you know, I don't know why they make, why they make him look like angry bird. So let's not be an angry bird, let's be an early bird. Amen? So after having done all, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 19 verse 16, on the third day, the glory of God appeared. When the people have diligently and obediently done it, the glory of God appeared. Now here is a problem. The problem is this. I want all of you to please listen very carefully. God commanded three million people to observe these three things. And Moses communicated to all the people. And three million people covenanted with God that we will obey whatever God said. And three million people, the old and the young, observe these three things for three days. And on the third day, because the whole nation 
was now ready. The whole nation has been washed. The whole nation has been sanctified. The whole nation has kept themselves away and only given themselves solely to God. God came. The problem today is if a pastor would stand and say to the congregation, only a few will obey. A majority will not obey commands like this. And, and then, okay, let's say, now let's say, suppose Pastor White, he stands at his church, and he tells them, okay, this is what God told me, and this is what we are going to do, first day, second day, on the third day, this is what it's going to do. 10% may obey him, 90% may not obey him. Or, 90% obeys him, 10% doesn't obey him. So on the third day, when the whole congregation is here, there is holiness and unholiness now mixed together. How can God come? How can God pour new wine when there is still old wine skin? He cannot pour. This is the problem with the new, is the present church today. People cannot obey. That's the problem. For an individual, you have no problem. You know, it's just you. You and God. You can have your personal revival. But we're not just talking about an individual. Now we're talking about a corporate church. Because God wants to pour out His glory in the corporate church. God doesn't alienate the church. He wants to include the church. So therefore, now God has plan B. So what he is going to do next is, he is going to blow the shaft away. He is going to blow the shaft away and such people whose hearts are not yoked together, God will kick them out of the church. They will just leave the church. And, you know Pastor White, the source people whom God is kicking out of your church, they will even come and tell you, God told us to leave the church. But it's not God telling them to leave the church. God is kicking them out of the church. <laughs> Please don't laugh. I'm telling you seriously what the Lord has told me. And I have seen this happening in our own ministry. The Lord clearly told me, I'm going to clean your ministry. And I'm going to kick out some of your staffs who are not walking right with me. And this is what they will tell you. Oh, God told us to go and get another job. And if someone tells you like that, there will always be some genuine people and most of the time, they are the shaft that God is blowing away. And the Lord said, always smile at them and leave, let them live in peace. So this will happen. When that happens, don't stop them. You must harden your heart like Pharaoh. It's very difficult for pastors to do that, you know. But you have, God will do that. He will remove the tears. So that only the wheat remains. The goat will be kicked out. So that sheep will remain. So that he can now bring the sheep to his pasture. And feed them with his own pasture. This is what God will do. Either we are drenched in the rain, you cannot hold an umbrella. These are the days when God is drawing a line of separation. And He is asking you to choose which side you will stand. The righteous side or the filthy side. The holy or the unclean. You choose. You choose which camp you will belong to. And when God cleans the church, which he's going to do, and that is my message on Sunday, how he's going to do that. A major portion may leave the church. Don't lose heart, Pastor White. Because remnant is always small. 
right? Remnant is always small. And the Bible also says, small, narrow is the way. And a small group will walk in the narrow path. And the small, the small group that walks in the narrow path, they are the called, the chosen, and the set apart. They are the called, chosen, and set apart. And God will bring in new people. Sanctified ones, called ones, chosen ones, and add to your congregation. What I am saying to Pastor White is what I am saying to many pastors who are here and all those pastors who are watching online. This is what God will do in his church. He will not allow his body to be defiled. So you choose this day whom you will follow. Let's kneel down for a word of prayer. As we are kneeling down, I ask you to examine your heart right now. Which camp do you belong? The sheep camp or the goat camp? Which camp do you belong? The wheat camp or the test camp? Which camp do you belong? The filthy camp or the holy camp? Choose you this day whom you will follow. I perceive in my spirit the hand of the Lord stretching out a scepter in this place. And the hand of the Lord lifting up this golden scepter saying, this is my righteous standard. And this call is also extended towards all those people who are watching online. Please kindly get up from your chairs and kneel down right now. Even though you may be watching from home, please don't be seated on your sofas or even lie on your bed or sit on your bed. Please kindly get up from your sofas in your chairs and your beds. And kneel down right now. And you decide today whom you will follow. Do not allow your church to be defiled. Do not allow your church to fornicate with the worldly standards and worldly principles. For the Holy Spirit says, for the Lord your God is a righteous God. He is a holy God who will not allow his name to be profaned. As the Holy Ghost flapped his wings and brooded over the waters as he brooded over the hearts and minds of men during the days of Noah as he does his work of conviction in this dispensation of grace He is extending his olive leaf.
to you this day asking you thank you wonderful lord jesus i see the holy spirit now taking on the form like the lord jesus christ and standing before me oh he looks so lovely just like the lord jesus christ and the bible calls it the spirit of christ he stands before me looking at you thank you wonderful lord jesus my dearly beloved brother pastor greg the holy spirit tells you put your house in order sanctify your house will you be bold to lift up the righteous standards of god in your church that you may be a lighthouse in your city if you are willing i will cause my glory to pass and dwell in your midst and you will become like a lamb that is placed on a hill top that will then draw all people to the light choose you this day whom you follow the first part of the message pastor greg is for your church now the second part of the message is for your family purpose in your heart that you will conduct your children and your grandchildren to walk right in the fear of god do not allow double standards no compromising standards in your family because you and your wife have determined to follow the lord your god god wants to visit you and make a covenant with you but put your house in order set up a godly standard a standard of righteousness in your home you talk to god right now my dearly beloved brothers and sisters sons and daughters the lord has asked you a question whom will you follow you open your heart and you tell him whom will you follow joshua said as for me and my household we will follow the lord can you say like that can you say like that not only you but your whole family the father the mother the children can you say like joshua me and my children my whole household we will walk after god we will follow god the holy spirit now signifies to me there's going to come a great sweeping a sweeping away in the body of christ not cleansing a sweeping away first the shafts and the dirt the dead leaves the dead branches must be cut and swept after it has been swept then the second process will involve cleansing and refining 
But the first thing that is going to happen is a sweeping. And this sweeping will involve sweeping away the unrighteous ministers of God. Unholy ministers of God. They will be swept away from the churches. Their past sins will come looking for them. And they will be forced out of the pulpit. In shame, will they resign and leave. And some will die prematurely because they judge not themselves. Because they are a hindrance, a stumbling block to the next level of leadership who will want to go on with the new things of God. Many pastor's wives will also be swept away because they are also been a big hindrance. And many of them are living double standard lives. They are like the whitewashed tombstones. Appears white on the outside, but inside they are like dead men's bones and ravening wolves. I see now the broom of the Lord, or God placing his broom at the doorstep of the church, ready to sweep away all the shaft. Shall we purpose in our heart? That we want to serve the Lord God all the days of our lives. Can you covenant with the Lord like that? No matter what the price is required. No matter what it takes. Lord, I will follow you all the days of my life. Not only me, but also my family. I will conduct my family as the priest of my family. I will conduct my family to walk in the fear of God, to walk in godly ways, to establish godly standards in my family. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. My dear brother Dave Newman, the Lord Jesus tells you, a breakthrough is going to come in your life very soon. A breakthrough. A new beginning is going to come very soon. Just hang on a little longer. A new dawn is going to come upon your life. The thing that you and your wife have been patiently waiting and asking God is going to come very, very soon. So sanctify yourselves. Prepare your heart. Prepare your mind for this new dawn that is going to come upon your life. I see the eyes of the Lord now turning and looking upon the young people who are in our midst, the unmarried young people. Keep your heart clean. Keep your body clean and holy and undefiled. 
for I have a desire <coughs> to fill you <coughs> excuse me with a new wine <coughs> with a new wine a wine that has never been given or tasted by anyone yet so keep your heart keep your mind in purity in holiness guard your virginity the virginity of your heart the virginity of your mind and the virginity of your flesh guard it keep it pure and clean for the lamb of god has a purpose for you thank you wonderful lord jesus let's all arise to our feet <coughs> and lift up your holy hands unto the living god and bless his holy name for his goodness for his kindness for his mercy The Bible says he is great in goodness. In his great goodness he came to talk to us. Amen. So lift up your hearts. Lift up your hands and bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. For he is good. For his grace and mercy endures for ever and ever come on don't keep quiet open your mouth and bless his holy name <coughs>